teams at the bottom of the table with so much to play for. Seven race to equal the try scoring record for the Crusaders. Right left and right now for the Montreal. He sends it. He sends it. Liam Hartley is shooting, wrestling over. And for the first time in their history, Moana Pasifika have a third win in a season. So we've got it here for Philly Wahi. He gives it away early for Lancaster. And welcome to The Breakdown. A pleasure to have your company this Sunday. My name is Kimberly Downs. First day here in The Breakdown Hot Seat. I am assured by my panel that everyone is going to go easy on me. Jeff Wilson, Mills Mulyaina, Justin Marshall. You're all behaving today, yes? Best behaviour? Yes, absolutely. We were all together last night as well, so... On your best behaviour again. Saying something, yeah. I can well, only well, we, you. We went in and debriefed, didn't we? Yep. Gentlemen, that great game down in Wellington, so... Uh, yeah, we've got plenty to talk about, haven't we? All right, we'll be looking forward to a great show then, Jens. <laughs> and let's just uh, let you know that I am in the hot seat for a reason. It is a very good one indeed, because our very own Kirsty Stanway Thorne has welcomed a new addition to her family and in doing so to the Sky Sport Fano. Welcome and hello to Bowie Mahutonga Stanway Thorne. Yes, Kirsty and Gareth entered, uh, welcomed their baby boy on Friday. Fantastic, Jeff but. And brought into this world and watching scrums <laughs> mm -hmm. to start his life. Amazing. Well, maybe it's a sign. Kirsty, seriously, come maybe, on. Maybe it is a sign. Okay? It's great. No, it's great it news. Such yeah. wonderful Amazing. news. So congrats uh, to Kirsten Gareth. We do hope you're enjoying all of this special time together. And we all can't wait for cuddles. I'm definitely not just speaking for myself there. On to the weekend, though. What a weekend it was. A few upsets. And Jeff, you know... Hard Look, weekend for you. Another, well, another hard weekend for me, but what we're going to do, first and foremost, though, let's, let's the Crusaders jersey from a couple of weeks ago was donated to me. I passed it on and we put it on Trade Me and we tried to raise some money for Kids Cam, which is the charity of the Crusaders. Rodney Tweed has put up $1,300. One of his stipulations, gentlemen, was that I had to sign it. This is one of, your, one of the biggest, proudest moments of your life. Oh, so proud right now. There Soak it is. It oh, there it is. Soak it up. There it is. <laughs> Done from Ty Tap. Thank you so much. And there's a, a big, big number going through to Kids Cam, which is fantastic. Thanks, Rodney. Well done. Yeah, good stuff, Rodney. Awesome stuff. Uh, Kids Can will absolutely love it. On the weekend, though, you know, your team, the Crusaders, going down. No. Jeff, and the Highlanders, too, which is why I was saying it was so tough. It was. It, there was an element that was tough, but what I did experience last night in Wellington was awesome. Mm -hmm. The fact watching two teams go at it, when you think about the Hurricanes and the Chiefs, where both those team teams were at, it ended up being a really good night for rugby, and look, the Hurricanes undefeated. Who would have thought right now at this point that they would be top of the table and not lost a game? It does feel somewhat like people weren't necessarily believing the Canes hype up until this point, up until they toppled the Chiefs. For you guys now, are they out and out favourites to become Super Rugby Pacific champions? Oh, I think, man, they are looking really sharp. I think, you know, always when you come back from the bye, especially the fact that, you know, you could almost miss a beat, you're a little bit rusty. They didn't, they started really well. I agree, Jeff, last night's game, Man, that was huge because it had that sort of that, that feeling, right? The big, the biggest game, in, in my opinion, of the round. But it almost they didn't play defensively, Marshy. They went out there and actually played rugby. Yeah, they did. And, and they've traditionally in the past, Hurricanes teams have faded a little in the last quarter. You can see they're fit. They've got massive competition within the squad, which I think is helping because players want to be out there. They want to be um, on the field playing this really exciting brand of rugby. Um, Am I convinced that they are the favourites to win it? Not entirely. Like, they are trending really well. Um, but, you know, the Chiefs, on a night where, you know, they probably lost Anton Leonard Brown before the game, probably Stevenson missing as well, and a few other things that didn't quite go their way, some scrum pressure, they were still in the fight. So you can still compete with this Hurricane side as good as what they're going at the moment. OK, so what, what would it take to convince you then, if you say you're not already over the line? Well, going to Fiji and winning over there for a start off, yeah. so that, that's, yeah, that's, that's, your right. next, that's your next <laughs> yeah. challenge, and that's not easy. And talking to Clark Laidlaw, didn't we, gentlemen, yeah. um, after the game, he said, 
Now that's a game nobody really wants. I think the only saving grace is it's in Suva rather than Latoka, which has been pretty difficult for teams to win at. But um, yeah, getting on the road, um, winning those games away, like they, they just scraped in against the Crusaders, um, who are nearly bottom of the table. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, the, the next few tests that they've got coming up will be... For me, I look at it though, they've, they've beaten the Blues and they've beaten the Chiefs. Probably the two form sides, two of the other form sides in this competition. The Brumbies as well are you know, a, a huge challenge and, and when they have them. But I, I just look at, the, at what they've got, what culture they've managed to bring in straight away with Clark Laidlaw. That he's settled in really quickly. Um, clearly there's a change in leadership, no Artie Sevilla in that group, uh, group. And it's given young players an opportunity and they've stepped up. And then now it's, it's almost like um, we saw them singing that song, right? All of a sudden there's an energy in that group, there's a belief, and it's a shared responsibility versus, I think Artie took a lot on his shoulders. Yeah. You know, he really had to carry them in a lot of ways, whereas now I think the maturity mills of some of these younger players who are now delivering in his position at number eight yeah. in the loose forwards, I think they're really strong in key areas, and the one thing they can always get, they've got plenty of guys who can carry the ball and get themselves going forward. Some teams don't have that. Yeah, and those young guys you're talking about have been given an opportunity, right? And it's not a sort of safe... Um, sort of selections, you know, Lark is there, you know, Yossi's sort of being put out there, and you're putting guys like Karifi, you know, on the bench, but even he's brought into it. You know, his um, role coming off the bench is a lot more important than perhaps even starting because he lifted them when he sort of came on. He made big, he won big moments, but they just look like a really, like, happy bunch. You know, it's almost like they've stripped everything away and we go, we're going to start again. They've, they've created a whole new culture. The way that they're playing, they, they look happy. Some of their players are key players that have probably plateaued over the years. They've gone to another level and um, that's exciting stuff for the, for, the, for the capital. OK, I want to put something to you then while we're talking particularly, you mentioned a few of the loose forwards there and you mentioned Artie Savia. Where would he then fit back well, into this team well, he, when he comes back? Well, he's the World Player of the Year, so he's available next year. My understanding is he's coming back into Super Rugby. I look at it though, Marshy, and you go, where do the other guys fit? And how do they look <laughs> at their future? How do they look at their future? Mm. If you're Braden Yossi, um, if you're Devin Flanders, you know, and you're going, hold on, what, what is it I'm going to do now? What's my role? How many starting opportunities am I going to get in? And all of a sudden you've got Brad Shields, who's obviously clearly come in, an old head, who's didn't play early on the season, but he's shown some real value right now. I look at it, Marshy, and I go, look, there's some decisions for some players to make with the Shields as a one year, but I, I don't see that. I see, I see them building depth, but by the same token, I don't want to stop some of these young guys continuing to keep developing. No, and that's the challenge, but, but you, they, they're also going to learn around somebody like Adi Savia, and that's not just on the field, that's off the field, uh, field training methods as well. But I guess probably... The strength of a team is not the starting team, is it? It's not the starting 15. Strength of the teams are 23. And I think at the moment, that's what they've got that is probably the catalyst for their success, which is their reserves are coming on because they are fighting for positions. They lose Geordie Barrett. Um, they, they can have plenty of players step in in the midfield. The loose forwards, there's a fight for positions there. Um, everywhere across the park, you lose Cam Roygaard, TJ steps in, you know? They've got massive depth in their squad, but yeah, when they have to fight for positions, you'd start to wonder where you're going to get game time from. I guess that's just natural. And you mentioned the, uh, you know, the likes of Duplessis Karifi on the bench. Let's talk about Peter Larkai, because he's someone who has developed under Adi Savia the last couple of years and has really come into his own this time around. Well, he's a young man who's filled out mills, and you look at him, who was, who was predominantly a number eight, um, had a big impact at the under 20 level, but he's matured, and for me, matured really, really quickly and being really effective, and there's not a lot he can't do as a loose forward. Carries strongly, works hard at the breakdown, he's got great hands, he's a super athlete. Uh, I, want to, I just want to see more of this guy, I really do. I just want to see more of him. And confidence, right? I mean, it's built on the partnership that he's having. It's a really nice balance in terms of the loose trio, but he understands his sort of role. When he gets out in the open, he sort of, even when he's at close quarters, you know, there's ability to explode through sort of tackles and get them, you know, going forward has been massive. I mean, look at these sort of numbers. And the more he plays, the better he's actually getting. For you as well, when it comes to this team as a whole, you mentioned earlier, you know, they've got the big challenge of going away to the Druid, then they're away to the Brumbies. So do you see them in the next couple of weeks, dare I say it, remaining unbeaten? or at some stage in this little period of really, really tough assignments, will they slip up? You get the feeling that they are, they are really motivated in terms of trying to stay where they are. You talk to the players after the game and then you talk to the coaching group as well. Everybody's on the same page. I think it's what you're 
alluding to about the, the team song and all that. They look, they look really focused on what they want to do. In fact, Brad Shields said in his interview to us after the game, you heard him say, we, had the, we, we knew what the next block was. So they're obviously working in these little blocks of, OK, we've got this one at home against the Chiefs, and then we go bang, bang against two Australian teams, sign that block off and reset. I think Clark Laidlaw has to get massive credit for what he's yeah. generated within that squad and where he's got the players to mentally, more than anything. Yeah. And it's helpful when you've got, like, a Safa Amua play one of the best mm. games of, of rugby I've seen in, in a long, long time. There was nothing he didn't do in this game. And we got glimpses of this when he first came in to NPC, but all of a sudden he's in the outside channel and, uh, you know, they, they, oh, he played pr virtually most of the game. I mean, he was that good. Uh, moments like these, you've got to cherish them. And you think of the 15,000 um, strong crowd got to witness, you know, I think this could be the coming of age of this young man, you know. Be nice if some of his darts just hit, <laughs> hit the spots a little bit better in terms of line-out time, but everything else is there. And he was up against Samasone Tokuyaho. He wanted to make a statement. He made a statement last night. Yeah, 100%. The fact that, you know, this is a massive game. And guys, you know, sometimes they go into their shell. Yeah, you're right, he missed a couple of darts, but I think he's you know, in, in hold, he's getting a lot better. And when you're able to free yourself up and get in the wider channels and understand his role, I mean, gee, he's in a devastating form. Well, I hate to lower the tone here uh, because <laughs> it is fun hyping up the Canes and getting on board the Cane train at the moment, but the Crusaders, the Highlanders, two more losses. For the weekend. Well, you look at me. Uh, Just start over there somewhere. You looked at me. Go, yeah. oh, exactly. I'm passing the ball over there. Somehow the Mills has managed to avoid the damage well, of the Chiefs. Yeah. Because yeah. when we're doing that debrief after the game, we're watching, we're watching the Highlanders play, yeah. and it was tough. It was a tough watch. Uh, what do you make of it? Well, I mean, you guys tell me, because I'm in a bit of a loss at the moment for where they're at. When I look at them, I, you can see that they have their moments in the game, but then they drift out of the game. And, and they concede and they, they lose their, their game plan to a degree. They start trying to play in the wrong, the wrong areas and all of a sudden they put themselves under pressure. They make an error or they don't exit right. Their strategy's slightly off. I think their energy levels are there and there's enough talent there, but at the moment they've just they're disjointed and, and that's really costing them because drifting out of games against good sides will hurt you. And the Rebels are a different side this year. You know, they've got some belief that they've probably only got to win one more game, the Rebels, maybe even get a few bonus points, and they're guaranteeing themselves a spot in the playoffs. I mean, Mills, for you? Oh, and also, the Rebels have got a lot going on off the field, right? And so yeah. they're playing with a lot of heart in terms of, you know, their financial situation. But I have to agree. I think they are trying, the Highlanders, they're trying almost too hard mm. and disjointed and then it becomes individualistic mm. and that's that's you know one of the issues that they're sort of facing I'm not not too sure where they're going into structure i think the key for me also is another change at first five you know Felia fungus comes in there patch i thought was really you know i don't know what, what's happened there if he stayed back and played club rugby or whether he's injured but i think the st stability in the team you've also got to remember final you know only starting to start you know last last yeah. couple of years he's come off the bench so that, those, that key combination, they're sort of missing a little bit because it's just constantly changing the, you know, the 10. Can I just give some kudos to the Rebels here as well? Because I think if you'd told any of us that at any stage of the season, the Rebels would be in the top four hmm. on the table, you'd have an absolute laugh. But let's move on to the Crusaders. Marshy, turning my head officially in this direction. <laughs> now, why do you think they're struggling so much? And, and we know that the injuries are obviously an issue, but beyond that... Well, again, I think it's very similar to what the Highlanders are going through. You know, like uh, they're really unsettled in some of their selections. Um, but they had some firepower back, uh, particularly bringing Ethan Blackadder back is really good. Um, and they're just starting to look after that uh, performance against the Chiefs like they were starting to get their rhythm. And then a catalyst for me, good, good Crusaders teams, um, and you guys would have played against good Crusaders teams in the past, they defend like their life depends on it. They do not leak points, and they are just leaking way too many points. And uh, it's not like Crusaders to fall off tackles. It's not like Crusaders to give away leads, to make fundamental errors. And at the moment, that clunkiness that we've seen all season is still existing. And there's enough experience in there. Yeah. Like, let, let's look at that back row. You've got Christie, you've got Cullen Grace, you've got Ethan Bladkater, you've got two, two um, very experienced players here. You've got Bauer and Newell up front. There's enough All Blacks there that have played big rugby. Uh, but they, are they inexperienced in key positions? Hooker, halfback, first five. 
really key positions. Fullback, Shafiaki, they're inexperienced players. Mm. The guys that have filled those spots, clearly, over the last four, five, six years, have been really top quality All Blacks. Yeah. You know, and this is a game, look, they should have won. They should have run out the clock when it came to, and that's a, a mistake that Rivers Rahana, I don't think anyone's going to make a mistake again like that. You know, you know, he's missed by, what, two seconds. He just needed to take two seconds longer in terms of that conversion. But I just look at them, they'll, they'll be clearly frustrated. I'm wondering, though, I'm going to pose the question to you, are the Australian teams a bit better this year? Are they closer? The fact the Rebels have started to get the job done. The Waratahs, if you think about it, they missed two big opportunities against the Drua, and they missed a, uh, a opportunity well, against the Blues as well. You know, so you think about that. If they won two more games, their season looks very, very different in terms of moments. So mm -hmm. we've just seen a weekend where uh, uh, the Australian team's proving, yeah, you know what, the Brumbies are a good side. Are they closer to us? Well, you'd be hope, you're hoping that uh, it is that, because <laughs> otherwise we've gone backwards. Well, yeah. Well, so we're, we're underperforming yeah. to where we usually are at the level that we do at Super Rugby where we've been very dominant against Australian teams. Um, yeah, if I thought about it, Mills, you, you might be different. I, I, I do think that they have improved. They've yeah, improved right. physically. They look like they've got more energy and tempo around their breakdown work. I don't know why, but maybe the whole country just recognised how dominated they got at the Rugby World Cup and have just gone, if we don't get up to speed in the off-season in these areas, we're going to get more embarrassment. And I, I just feel that that's just been a catalyst for them to lift their work rate, lift their physicality, and, and toughen up. Yeah. And they look tough. The only other team I'd have to say is probably the Reds. They came out with a hiss and a roar, and they've almost sort of gone you know, a little bit sort of um, backwards, and, well, obviously in terms of the, the results, but I think you know, the, the other Aussie teams have definitely gotten a lot better, and they've adapted a lot mm. better um, as, as this competition has gone on. We mentioned the Reds there, Mills, and we did see Moana tip up uh, the Reds in Whangare, and it led to a bit of an interesting conversation, actually, with Sir Michael Jones after the match about that Northland venue. All the good people of Whangarei and Northland, um, they've been really encouraging us to consider this seriously. So we, I mean, one win from one game, so that speaks for itself. We might have to just reposition ourselves and find a, a location right here uh, in Te Taitokaro. How's that? If you cast aside, I guess, some, some of the practicalities around mm. things, do you think that potentially Te Tai Tokoro, Northland, Whangarei could make a good home base for a team that, let's not forget, has had to now host games in three different regions this season? Oh, they've got to have a base somewhere, right? And given the fact they're well looked after these facilities, yeah, the ground has been fantastic, Nick, uh, on, uh, on Friday night. Um, Perhaps they need to look at that, you know, I mean, because it's just so disjointed in terms of, you know, their fan base as well, where to sort of go. I mean, they've hosted three different venues, so that could be well and surely an option. The only rebuttal I'd offer it to it is, and this has got to be considered, is it's not just about where you play, it's where you train. Mm. And, and it's really important for professional outfits, outfits to have access to the same quality equipment and training facilities that every other team has. And, and that's usually a problem when you go outside of the bigger cities getting access. Oh. So what they would need would be to then have funding to set up a proper gym and a proper re uh, recovery room. And but aren't you better off, Marshy, at least having some roots somewhere? Because at the moment you're moving around, you haven't been able to... But, but, but to you wouldn't want to travel there from... But you can live there, though. I mean, if you yeah. could live there and the fact that if it allows you to play of your home games, five home games there, and you play one game in uh, Tonga and one game in Samoa, yeah. and, you, and you base yourself there, but it, you're far enough away from anybody else that you can own that. And I've got a sense the Northland Union itself, who have hosted one Blues game, I think, in 10 years, would say to themselves, well, this is a team we could get in behind. This is a, a, and I, I've got a sense that they would jump on this opportunity, but I, th I think they need to find somewhere that they own. Because if you're, you're talking about a team that relies so heavily on its culture to come together, to they're living in all parts of Auckland, travelling to North Harbour Stadium. Mm. You know, you're talking hour, hour and a half in a car. You know, it, I spoke to Sukopi Kipu about this. You know, it's, it's difficult and challenging. I know there was ideas maybe out at Grower Stadium in counties that was another idea that was posted. But I, I look at the Whangarei option and go, you know what? It's a, it's certainly a good enough stadium yeah. um, for you to play Super Rugby at. Yeah. If you're the Blues and you hear Sir Michael Jones say that. How would you be reacting? Would you be going, uh-oh, danger zone here? Or are you just cooling your heels a bit? Oh, I don't think... I'm, I don't think they would have taken much of it. I think 
Sir Michael Jones is just stating the fact they were well looked after during that week. They need some a base to sort of to, to sort of find their roots. The ideal place would be in the islands, right? If you're going to have funding and you're going to get you know to, to get that, those facilities up and running, why can't they do exactly what the draw are? They are that's the base should be over in, in, in the Pacific Islands where where the team sort of live and stay and breathe and, and guys come over to play over there. That would be the ideal plan. But for now, you know, Whangarei was magnificent place for them and, and perhaps that conversation needs to happen. Uh, well we have also just had some news through in the last hour. The Blues utility Ford Cameron Suafua has tonight revealed actually that he's been receiving radiation treatment after discovering a tumour last year. So he was actually playing last month while he was going through this radiation treatment. A very scary time obviously for the 25 year old and his loved ones but in very typical fashion it seems that he is determined to stay upbeat. Yeah, just um, recently been diagnosed with uh, cancer. Um, can't really pronounce the name of it, but I had a tumour taken out at the end of last year. Be stuck seeing why me all the time where I can hopefully pull, like bring something positive out of this and come back here yeah, fitter and stronger hopefully and then, and then sort of just aim to pick up where I left off. What a fantastic attitude. All the very best to him. Uh, we do hear from the Blues. He's finished receiving that treatment. So he is on the journey back now. And we absolutely cannot wait to see him get back out there on the field. Right, stay with us. Because we are with the Super Rugby Opiki champions after the break. Welcome to Eden Park. It is the Opiki final. And it is the Blues taking on the Chiefs. Good was that. Yes, the Blues emerging triumphant in Super Rugby Opiki for the very first time. New champions crowned and we are delighted to have the player of the match from that final joining us now. Caitlin Vahakolo <laughs> is in, on the line. And Caitlin, I tell you what, I was watching you while we were playing those clips and when you heard your name as you were scoring the tries, you looked pumped, you've got the medal on, you've got the t-shirt on. How is it all feeling 24 hours later? It still hasn't really sunk in yet, but I'm just, I'm so happy. I'm so stoked for our team and just that we've been able to do this. Even though it was, we made it a bit hard for ourselves uh, to the 77th minute, but we got there, so yay. <laughs> Caitlin, I have to ask you, look, uh, I suppose it was round four or five. You guys had a fantastic one, a couple of really important ones. Was there a moment though you got a sense there was a shift in the season, the belief that you could go on and win this title? I honestly think from the first camp that we had together, there was just a bond that, and it just felt different from last year. Um, I don't think there was a massive shift, like a massive moment we had this big shift, but I think each week we were chipping away and it was getting better and better up until the final. And yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Caitlin, I've got to ask about your coaches. I mean, the, the whole lot of them, I mean, they're pretty handy uh, sort of players themselves. What influence do they sort of, uh, you know, have on sort of the, you know, your overall performance and, and the, I suppose, the guidance they sort of showed you? Well, well, first of all, they're awesome. They're almost like kind of like our friends too, not just our coaches. But um, I think what was really special about this management team is that they would always remind us, even though we're coaching you, it's up to you guys what you choose to do within the game. You guys are the ones playing and... I think they kind of gave us the freedom as a team to play the way that we wanted and the way that felt, I guess, free for us as players, not just what they wanted. And, um, yeah, I, I feel like it definitely showed when we played the final and won. Yay! Caitlin, Justin here. Uh, congratulations, first of all. Fantastic. You must be... Why well, you look thrilled. Good on you. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your own personal form. It's been absolutely sensational. Now... Is that you just finding and looking for the ball on the field or is that part of the team, uh, team tactics to get you in the game as much as possible, considering you're liking scoring tries at the moment? 
<laughs> um, I think this season was a big uh, journey of confidence for me and just finding my the way that I want to play. And I think that um, the coaching staff just gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted and do, do what I wanted to do that would make me feel confident and make me attack and defend in a way that was... I guess, useful for the team. Um, yeah, and it just ended up working in our favour, I guess, yeah. Well, you mentioned the team there, Caitlin, and I did want to talk about that as well because it feels like for a couple of years now, the Blues have had a fantastic team on paper and it's just not quite clicked until this year. So what is it about this season and this group particularly? Do you think that's just everything's fallen into place? <laughs> that is such a good question. I honestly... I think what sets us apart from other teams, I see this yes, I see this in the final after our match, but just our love and trust for one another. I feel like we have such a special connection off the field and we just really prioritised that within our season and it just was able to transfer onto the field. And I think that's really important, not just in women's rugby, but in, in, in sporting environments in general. And I think we were really able to draw from that and, yeah. You, you were one of the trailblazers, I suppose, in going to you know, the WNRL and then coming back, which we're so glad that you came back to Ōpiki, but you're, you're seeing a common trend there. Some of the uh, girls are actually starting to, to sort of go over there. Does it worry you a little bit that, um, that, that uh, they're going over and playing in the WNRL? I think that whatever opportunities are going to help our women get the best support they can and become the best athletes they can, that they should do that, whatever that is. It could be union, it could be league, but, yeah, I support whatever is going to give our woman opportunities that are going to make them thrive. So, no, I'm not worried. Caitlin, uh, just lastly, I, I want to ask you the future of Super Rugby Opiki. What is it you particularly would like to see this competition become, not just next year, but in the future? I would really... I think it would be really awesome if we expanded. I think... Um, It'd be cool if we uh, kind of included the Australian side. I know that over there they don't get full-time contracts and I think if they were a part of this competition, it would really help with their skill level and help them, I guess, better their craft because um, there are some awesome, awesome talent. There is some awesome, awesome talent from Australia and um, it'd be cool if we could connect with them. That'd be really exciting. I would love if there was a couple more teams from New Zealand. I know that um, Matatu dominates most of the South, South Island side, but if we were able to expand a bit more, I think... It would bring in more of an audience, it would bring in more opportunity um, and it would just help our game grow a lot more and I guess the skill level as well would improve heaps. So, yeah, I want it to grow more. Caitlin, thank you again so much for your time. Congratulations. Thank you for your thoughts as well. I hope you had a great time celebrating because you certainly deserved it. It was <laughs> a ripper of a season for you and a fantastic final. So go well over the next few weeks. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I will just say, I'm making a giant assumption there that she's going to be called into the Black Ferns camp and yeah. they are playing uh, next month, of course, the Black Ferns back in action. But I wanted to touch on a couple of things that she said, expanding the comp. Jeff Wilson is looking at me and making the gestures well, like he's got, well, got something on his mind. Well, well uh, I think you posed the question that the fact four teams doesn't feel like a competition just yet, does it? It's the fact they're making the best of what they've got. The moment you expand, there'll be a little bit of the fact maybe it comes down in terms of some of the quality, right? Because you're spreading the talent around. So you've got to find and work out what the number of those teams are. Whether or not Australia, they themselves could form one or two teams out of all of their groups. We've had this conversation before about Australia reducing teams, but if they managed to get, you know, a couple of teams together that you knew were going to be competitive. Now, all of this could change if all of a sudden Super Rugby changes, right, in terms of eligibility, who you can play for, how much stronger mills they could get in Australia if a couple of Kiwis went and played for them. So all of a sudden, and then you've got the um, uh, the Fiji and Druana, Druana, I think that's right, who, who have been winning the Australian competition, and whether or not they're an option as well. But it's just whether or not you're prepared to live with the fact that while some of these players are getting up to speed if you do expand, that some of the quality might drop. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I think they've been talking about it. I think the, the, the natural transition would be to include Aussie, right? I mean, that's, um, to be fair, it would be the next way to go. I think you've spoken about it for a wee while. Um, Fiji have been really good in that competition there. And what does that kind of look like? You know, bringing that sort of, uh, the trans Tasman, so a Moana team, similar to, to Super, but... Again, you know, where, where are we going to get these um, these what these ladies up and, and up to scratch? You know, um, there's no doubt they've moved, they've shifted a bit in terms of you know uh, the competition this year. 
the trouble is, is you know, you don't, you don't want to sort of over overdo it initially, and then sort of find that it's 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 far too much. Um, so I think there's got to be some discussion around sort of what it looks like and whether the, tra the Trans Tasman um, option might be the the viable. But like any competition, there's always a teething process, isn't there? And and there's always the opportunity to have discussions about how to improve the product, how to make it better for the woman as well, and how how to make it the most appealing it can be. And 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 finding the space, I think, would, hap would help. Like, you look at the, the women's Six Nations is played after the men's Six Nations. They don't compete for, for eyes on, you know? So they play after and they play at slightly different stadiums and they get, to a degree, probably a slightly different crowd or some of the same people that, have, that don't have to choose between buying tickets at that time of the year. So, you know, I, we, we, those discussions should come into it here. You know, is it in the right space? Is it at the right time when Super Rugby's got big blockbuster games at the weekend. Uh, are we... Look, why compete? Look, let's be honest. Four o'clock on Saturday afternoon was, uh, for me, wasn't the right time. And I don't, I don't know how they came to that decision. I don't know what part we played in it. I don't know what part New Zealand Rugby played in it. And the teams and the Players Association. But to think what was on yesterday afternoon, the start of the ANZ Premiership, the netball competition, they, the, the Magic were playing in Hamilton at exactly the same time. Mm. If you've got people who wanted to go to both, the fact you've got the Chiefs Manawa coming up, you know, State Highway 1, and then the Warriors are playing at the same time as well. You know, you've got to give them the opportunity to succeed, you know, and... and to promote. To promote and, and yeah, then play... Because it was a great game of rugby. Well, it was. <laughs> so... but, then, but also play it in probably the right size stadium. Mm. The fact that all of a sudden you can get the right atmosphere. I think there are some little things that, well, that are big things in the grand scheme of getting better exposure, getting, I think, a better atmosphere, but also just giving them, like you say, giving them the space and opportunity to succeed. Well, I want to add some context there. Like you say, you know, why did they have to play a Saturday afternoon when they're up against the Warriors, up against the netball as well? We do need to remember that when it comes to the contracts for Super Rugby Opiki players, they are only contracted effectively four days a week, Thursday through till Sunday. So it doesn't leave a huge amount of options. So does then the option become, well, you've got to go full-time. But then where does that leave the players who also have jobs? Yeah, I, I get that. And, and like you said, sometimes there are those compromises that might have to be made. But in terms you know, of, of working out and making the sacrifice you need to for the betterment of the game, understanding, you know, uh, and uh, there's a recovery day after that. And, but this is the final we're talking about. You want it to be centre stage. Mm. You want it to be on its own, put up in lights, saying there's nothing else you should be watching other than this final. So maybe we need to be better prepared or find a different window. I wanted to put one more question to you as well around OPICI and is it fit for purpose in its current state for what it was originally designed for back before the World Cup which is helping players get the best preparation possible for a World Cup because at this stage the competition has a similar format next year, next year is a World Cup year, are you satisfied that that's enough game time for them going into what will be a World Cup year? Well, I don't think four teams, like you said, is a competition, is it? I mean, if you're looking to... They've got to start thinking about that. The good thing is about it now, that they've had those discussions, they've moved, they've, they've moved that, you know, they've sort of, you know, um, pushed it out to four. There's still going to be, you know, um, conversations needing around it. But you've got to remember, we're competing against, you know, the Six Nations that they've had, um, you know, those competitions ongoing. They've got a premiership that the women play over there. I mean, we've got to get to that stage. But I think you've, you've just got to make sure you're, you're gentle about it and not, and not go out too hard because but there's certainly little, little factors that have changed. And it does tie in as well, doesn't it, to a much bigger discussion around the game. And we're always, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, it seems fan-centric, fan-centric. But for you, Jeff, and you were making a couple of comments before the show that I know you want to elaborate on. Uh, the community game, the professional game, the link between them, it, is, is it there properly? Well, I think there's some simple things. Look, oh, oh, we were in we're, uh, Sky Stadium in Wellington and there was a, a development game being played. So there's... 23 guys, probably 25 players, have come from um, Chiefs area, and there's another 25 who have come to play in this. And look, the, the spectacle of the main game was amazing, fantastic. I've got to commend the Hurricanes giving us the access here, the light show beforehand. I'd say one recommendation do the light show at half time again to bring the energy back into the stadium. You know, it was impressive. But there was a curtain raiser with two development teams. Why aren't they playing club rugby? These guys, there's, you know, there's a club round in, in Wellington, and yes, you want a higher level of competition, but club rugby suffering then. You want these guys to go back and show leadership and to grow, and I, I think it's an important part of connecting back 
to the club rather than taking them out. The number of times NPC teams are guilty of taking players out of finals to go to camps before an empty NPC um, competition. I think these are really, really important connection points, and I, I don't, I don't know, I don't make sense of that. That these guys, I know you want competition. Go back to your clubs and play. The franchises want to control them. Yeah, they the, want them in their environment. I totally agree. Like, w w to grow the game, we need those players as much as we can playing club rugby. Yeah. They need to, to, to go along, run onto a club rugby field, and the kids that are going there to watch that main game, the club, the, they are seeing their heroes yep. all of a sudden in just the normal, natural environment that they live in. Yep. And they're touchable and yeah. tangible. So I totally agree. The reason they do those development games and because they want to control the players and the narrative yep. and, 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 and try and keep them in their own little environment, don't they? <laughs> so they're, they're protecting them to a degree. Like, you, you're going to get... Go club rugby is a different level. There's, there's well, no, the there's Dunedin, no TMOs there, there the, the, watching the filthy Hollanders, play going on. The Hollanders <laughs> on the weekend, Rhys Patchell, I don't know, he played club rugby down in Dunedin. You know, they released them back to club rugby. Did he rugby. survive that? Well, I, I hope so. <laughs> yes, I really hope so, because yeah. I think it's a critical part of it. You know, there's some other things that, you know, we talk about fan centric. You know, I, you know this is a wider discussion, but the, you know, I worked in a game where essentially there's 16 reserves. Every stoppage you play for the second half, probably for the whole second half, they ran a reserve on. Mm. Just another reserve, another reserve, one at a time, one at a time. It's just, it's an ongoing, I, I think it's an issue with the game. The referees are spending all this time doing a great job, speed it up, let's get going, let's get going, and then teams can control in the second half the speed of the game because they'll, oh, we'll roll out one prop, oh, we'll roll out our hooker, we'll roll out another prop. And you're talking, that's a good 45 seconds before one guy on the far side of the field. These are things you control, and I think you've got to, somehow we've got to find a way, whether it's on penalties only, or when tries are scored, or that you can make reserves. But at the moment, I just think it's too much in terms of taking the flow out of a game. Well, while we're talking about things you can control then, one of those, the venues. Obviously, at the game on the weekend that you were at, great crowd in a 30,000-seat stadium. It possibly looked a little smaller than it actually was, but there were about 16,000 people at yeah. the Hurricanes Chiefs games. Do, does it need to be moved? Do some of these teams need to be going to smaller venues to make it look like more people are attending? Where are the smaller venues? <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but the stadiums in New Zealand, other than Eden Park, are yeah. pretty good, right? Mm. Christchurch is good. It's going to be good when it gets its new one. Dunedin's good. Hamilton's a good stadium, you know, no problems there. You know, so I look at it and I, I just this thing on numbers. If you go around the world, the world's top teams, the world's top teams around the whole world. Let's have a look at some of the numbers. I just want to talk through this. These are these are the top sides. Toulouse, La Rochelle. Their home ground holds 19,000 people, 500. 16,000 at La Rochelle, right? If you stick, stick the 15,000 or 16,000 that were at Westpac, uh, sorry, Sky Stadium, it's full. It's full. It's yep. full. You yep. played over there, Marshy, right? Yeah. These are the size stadiums. Look, Saracens has only got 10,000 people going to their game. Mm. So this perception that we haven't got people going to the games, when you compare to these games, we have got fans in stadiums. And the other side of it, which is really relevant, is they're there every week because if you don't, get yourself organised, you'll miss out. Yeah. Because if the team starts playing well, because the stadium's only got a certain capacity, there's no tickets available. It, it is. It's genuine common sense. It's a better environment. People get, you know, into a, a full stadium. They love it. The, the players love it. But we, we are operating with stadiums, unfortunately, that are built for test matches. Yeah, but, but Hamilton's been fantastic, yeah. if you think about it, Mills. I mean, the, their numbers have been really good, particularly last year as well, successful side. You, you start carrying 16,000, 17,000 people. Mm. Population, you think about some of the populations of those cities. Yeah. You know, I, I just think we've got to be a little bit more realistic about, realistic about the world we live in, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I think that when, you, when you put it like that, you know, it, it does actually make sense. The fact that, you know, perhaps Go Media might be another option, or the Warriors that are getting, you know, I mean... Smaller stadiums and the atmosphere for the for the games, and it builds that sort of you know, the whole hype around it. Yeah. No, I think you've got some some merit there. I reckon you guys just need to put some suggestions into the uh, Bill Foley Stadium proposal that they're looking at down on the Auckland waterfront, and we'll get right into it. Right, there yeah. is someone else we wanted to actually introduce you to tonight. She is the Chiefs physio, also this year named as the assistant physio for part of this year's All Blacks squad. She is a former Black Fern, also represented. Aotearoa Māori Sevens, and she sat down with me, only slightly reluctantly, in Hamilton. I've always been a really competitive person. I think that's just always been me and 
trying to be as good as I can at something was just the way that I'm programmed, I think. So I knew I was going to be finishing up rugby at some point soon. Uh, there was a bit of a transition period with Waikato Rugby and I knew that SNC there and he asked if I'd be interested in physio. It sort of transitioned pretty quickly. Kev McCoy, who was the physio here at the Chiefs, was also looking for someone just to help. So that was my foot on the door at the Chiefs and then work hard and that clicked and Kev kept me on. <laughs> yeah, that was 20, 2016. Someone did ask me earlier, do you want to be physio for the All Blacks one day? And it just wasn't on my radar. I was like, that won't happen. Um, but it has. So yeah, a few years back, this is not where I thought I'd be. Sitting in the room with all of the coaches, it's like, oh yeah, okay, this is that step up. And then it was, I really got to nail this. This is like your one shot. Really got to nail it. When I was at school, I had no idea about um, physio pathways, career, never considered achievable. Not that it was anyone had said you can't, but it just was not something on my radar. And what's been real cool is my kids' reactions to sort of seeing their mum being able to be down at Captain's Runs and actually like giving them the opportunity to see the space, because it's not an opportunity that um, many kids would get really like that. Being involved with one of the most successful sporting teams that you can be, that's amazing. Um, awesome coaching group, so real excited about that. Like I'm real comfortable to keep pushing and keep putting time in, into my mahi because they're gonna see that and their little faces sort of light up. They get real excited. It's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then randomly had another awesome little girl. She's eight years old and she wants to be a physio. Came to the game with her dad and had a sign and then they emailed me sort of after. That was kind of cool that actually if you see someone, um, maybe that wasn't on your radar, but now that's something and if that's gonna, I don't know, keep her going into staying in school and having a bit of a path towards study, that's, that's pretty cool. When I think of Richie, whether he was playing the game or he wasn't, it was, there was always a standard that was, this was where Skipper set the standard. So I sort of feel like, you know, as being a player that's been around him and seeing a lot of the young players around him as well, He'd always have the level set, even though he didn't know it. The way he trained, the way he talked, uh, the way he carried himself around, uh, around, around the team. Welcome back to The Breakdown. Hopefully we'll also have some game changes in the under-20s. That squad has been named this week. Let's have a little look, shall we? 31 players have been named, representing 10 provincial unions. So congratulations to all of them and their families because it's a really big moment in a young player's life to be named for a team like this. Mills, uh, they were picked out of a Super Rugby Under-20 tournament and they had some training camps last year. I believe you actually went down to that Super Under-20 tournament in Topor. What did you make more broadly of, of the young talent? Oh, well, there is still plenty of talent around. I mean, that's obviously with, with the spread of the team as well. It's sort of well spread. The Crusaders took the... Uh, the under 20s out there weren't that flash last year but it was interesting to see them come back the depth of the squads as well because it's a really hard tournament it's in a short period of time mm. um, and guys just you know knock themselves around you know the door in it the Moana Pacifica and also uh, are barbarians but uh, I think the thing with New Zealand is um, we've still got plenty of talent it's just how we nurture them through and it's great to see also that they've you know created this, this the championship for these guys to play in the under 20s yeah, because as you mentioned, they will now go over to Australia. They're off to the Sunshine Coast, uh, where they are going to be playing part of this Under-20 Rugby Championship tournament, which is an inaugural tournament, so a new initiative. Is that something you'd like to see, Marshy? Yeah, absolutely. I think we have fallen behind the rest of the world in the Under-20 zone ever since COVID, and the rest of the world have, and the results have shown that at the Under-20 tournament, gone ahead of us and they're playing each other much more regularly like they've got the, the northern hemisphere teams a great competition over there so broadening our scope and playing against the, the rugby championship sides very very good idea 
more the merrier. The more rugby they get at that age yeah. in that environment, <laughs> the better they'll be in the long term. And what is great for us here on The Breakdown as well is that it has actually inspired, as I understand it, Mills's moments. It has. Spot. It has this week. And, um, you know, given the fact that we've seen a name in the under-20s and possibly my own sort of personal experience as well with my kids being named after rugby players by my oldest son, Damien McKenzie, and also... Geordie Barrett, thanks for the, uh, the photo <laughs> last night too, boys. So my moments this week is how names were, were sort of come up with. And the first one, really, uh, if we look at, and it's the under-20s, and it's uh, A1, A1 Lolofier. Um, so A1 Lolofier from the, um, the Highlanders. His, he was named, um, his dad actually named him after A1 Apples because he was an apple picker. And A1s was <laughs> considered the best apples at the time. So they are good. They're good. Quality, top quality apples. <laughs> so A1 was named after the best apples. Next one for me is Apollo Perilini. We all know Apollo Perilini. Very hard hitting loose forward, Auckland loose forward. He was named Apollo because he was born on the day, I suppose, that uh, the Apollo Space Project had landed. So Apollo Perilini was, uh, was, was named on that day. The next one, Manu Samoa Tuilangi. The pride of England. Apparently, <laughs> the pride. <laughs> oh, so the media have often said, suggested that countries like New Zealand pillage the players from, from the islands. Mm. Might be a little bit of truth to that. And so he was named Manu Samoa Tuilangi. Bucky's Botha, the next off the list. Now, you may be forgiven if you thought Bucky's was named after a hard hitting truck or a big truck because he rolls people over. But he's actually named Bucky's because he had uh, knock knees. Um, his, his real name is actually John Potter. So Bucky's was created from the fact he had knock knees, which sort of bend in. And Lester, Lester Fainganuku, because man, this is a massive one. So his father played for Tonga. They beat Italy in 1999 in Leicester, uh, the World Cup. His father, Tol, played in. And Wales was also one of the host nations. So, gee, Wales was in there as well, his middle name. And Twickenham was the next venue uh, they are playing us. So Leicester's full name is Leicester Ofaki, Wales, Twickenham, Fainga Not bad. Oh, oh. Not bad. Impressive. Yeah. Well, all three of you have probably got kids out there somewhere named after you. You know, oh. people's heroes growing up. Well, that's what I said. My, my, my kids are named uh, Mackenzie Junior. Uh, after Damien Mackenzie, because my older son, that was his favourite player at the time. My next son was uh, born the following year and uh, He's named Marco Geordie, so Geordie Barrett, because that was his other favourite player. So there's all blacks all over the place getting, well, kids being named up. <laughs> what are you, what are you laughing about? Oh no! I, I, I had a horse. <laughs> <laughs> the guy approached me to have the horse called Justin Marshall, oh. but that was after the Christian Cullen horse. Yep. And that was an amazing horse. <laughs> but that horse that's named after me, that thing is grazing in some paddock somewhere lazy as <laughs> thing. I don't think the one I don't think the one that was named after me as well was it's not grazing same. anywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> certainly wasn't fast enough. No. It was just called Jeff, this thing. It was just oh, yeah. Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've got Jeff. a new ambition in life, and that is to have a horse named after me. Oh, Thank you, Tim. Well, I'm just make sure you pick a good one. That's my boss. <laughs> If you get the chance I'll, to. I'll do my best. Right, let's have a look now. Forward at the next weekend and what is coming up. The highlight you would have to suggest would probably be the Blues Brumbies clash back at Eden Park. What are we thinking? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that the Brumbies come with all their firepower and come with a really positive attitude. The last time I was looking forward to them coming to New Zealand, a big game was against the Crusaders and Stephen Larkham brought an underpowered, understrength side and decided to use that opportunity to rest a few. If you're going to win this competition, you've got to come and play these big blockbuster games with your best players and test yourself before you get to a semi-final or final. So that's my, my challenge to you, Brumbies. Do that, please. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a belter of a game. Really, it's because Brumbies are playing such good rugby at the moment, as are the Blues. Yeah, and the Blues will find out exactly where they're at, I think. From the yeah, they the will. Fact that they've had some significant injuries in their group, you know, San Sullivan and then Stephen Petafeta. They're relying on Harry Plummer to fill that role at first 5'8 until Petafeta comes back. 
but the Brumbies are the best Australian team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most consistent, well-performed, balanced team, got good ball carriers. They've got a, uh, a, a team that understands exactly who they are and, got, and are playing with confidence. So, like you say, this is a great one for them if they come to New Zealand and win this and game. And win in New Zealand. And, and that changes the whole dynamic for them. I'm yeah. actually and quite excited about the Blues because I don't think they've hit their straps yet. And they're still, you know, they're winning some good games and they've had to win them hard, but I don't think there's... So you're off the Chiefs now onto the Blues? I've always been on You've been all over the shop <laughs> lately, actually, Mills. <laughs> oh, you went Chiefs, Hurricanes, <laughs> LA, it was all oh, okay. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm both members. Chiefs, Mana. Chiefs, Mana, mate. And then Blues. Oh. Blues, Mana. All right. Just oh. very quickly, uh, Crusaders Force, is this the most interesting bottom of the table, sorry, Marshy, clash in Super Rugby history? Well, this is it for the Crusaders. They've got to win this game. Yeah, they do. They've got to win it. If they don't win this game, then I so think yes, they're done. Very interesting. Yep. <laughs> very interesting <laughs> one of the table clash. And so is the Hurricanes Drua. That's going to be so that's a good weekend. A belt of a game. So it's a good weekend. Yeah. yeah. Red Highlanders as well. Yeah. Pretty good. It was good of you to say all of that with a smile on your face. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Yeah. Well done. And it Pleasure. has also Pleasure. been. An that's why I'm here. <laughs> to bring the smiles. Bring the smiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not be a punching bag. We do very much appreciate all three of your time, though, here on The Breakdown as ever tonight. Thank you for going easy on Welcome. me. Welcome. Appreciate you joining us as well at home. Good night. This was the exact spot that we played in when we first started this competition, so to finish it off like this, it's what dreams are made of, I reckon.